So I'll give you guys about 30 seconds to copy down what has been put on the board so far. All right, so piecewise functions are used to represent situations where behave, rules of behavior change, uh, change abruptly. S and uh, a piecewise function is defined as a function where different intervals have different rules of behavior. Let's go ahead and take a look and see what these look like and how they behave over at the document camera. Okay. So, a good example of this sort of behavior can be found in in a uh, overtime pay. If you have a function that tracks how much money you've earned at a job, then you'll earn a certain number of dollars per hour until you hit a certain number of hours, at which point you start making, making extra money per hour, overtime pay. So let's say So I'll start by describing a situation. Let's say that oh, this marker. Why are all my markers dead? Okay. So let's say that Nalani has a summer job working as a lifeguard.
She makes eight dollars an hour. For the first forty hours of work. And twelve dollars per hour. For each hour of work after that, and that's per week. Hours per week. Oh, four. Okay, so here we have a situation where a behavior, the behavior of a system changes abruptly. For each hour she works, she makes $8 until the 40th hour, at which point the behavior changes abruptly and she makes much more money. Now this system, this system 40 hour, uh, you, you, uh, you know, uh, some amount of money per hour and then time and a half or an extra 50% per hour, that's the way overtime generally works, at least in the United States by law. So let's Make a table of values of her earnings. Over a week. Okay. So does everybody have this written down? I can't keep both this and a graph on screen or a table of values on screen at the same time. So make sure that you have this down. I'll give you about 10 more seconds to get this down. Will I get a drink? Will I drink have a drink of water? Okay, so I'm going to put this aside. I'll bring it back and refer to it as needed. So anyway, we need to make a table of values.
Okay. I'll put it over here. I hope I gave myself enough room. Hours, hours worked. And pay. Mm, I'll uh, make this a bit wider. Okay. So, all right. So she makes eight dollars an hour for the first forty hours of work. So I'm gonna, div I'm gonna write our table in multiples of five hours worked. That seems fairly sensible. So. Five hours, 10 hours, 15 hours, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, that's the magic number, 45, 50, 55. Okay, so after five hours of work, well, she's paid $8 an hour. Five times eight is 40. So after five hours of work, she makes $40. After 10 hours of work, that's going to be $80. And then 120. One six, right? That is one sixty. Eight times twenty is one sixty. Yeah. Okay. Two hundred dollars. Two hundred and forty dollars. Two hundred and eighty dollars. Three hundred and twenty dollars. Great. Now then, this, in this, and once you hit 40 hours, that is where your overtime pay kicks in. Every hour after 40 is worth an extra 50%, is worth time and a half, which means it's going to be $12 an hour. 12 times 5 is 60, is 60. So, 320 plus 60 is 380. Three eighty plus 60 is 440 plus 60 is 500. So we have a table of values of our earnings. 
man, some people are having trouble staying in the room. They're dropping and rejoining. Okay. So now let's go ahead and graph this. I'll go ahead and make each horizontal tick mark. Uh, so this is going to be hours worked. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. So I'm going to make, whoa. I'm going to make each big tick mark. 25 hours. That makes each little tick mark five hours. In the vertical axis here, I'm going to have to put it on the inside because my big dumb table is in the way. Well, actually, I can squeeze that in there. Space. And this is pay. In dollar dues. OK. And uh, for our scale, I'm going to make each tick mark. $50. So this is 250 and this is 500. Okay. So after 5 hours of work, she earns $40. 50, 100, 150, 200, 250. Okay. So after well, after 0 hours of work, you make $0. After five hours of work, you make 40. After 10 hours, 80. Higher. After 10 hours, 80. 120. 160. Note that this is making a straight line. She is making a certain number of dollars per hour. So this is a linear equation here. OK, after 30 hours, it's 240. Yeah, just a smidgen less than that. OK. 280. No. Yeah. 320 hours. Three hundred and eighty hours. Four hundred and forty oh, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Right, we had the magic number happen, 25, 25, 30, 35, 40. So after 40 hours, things are going to start looking different. Now it's at 380. So 250, 300, 350. So up here, and after 50 hours of work, 440 is just beneath 450. So here, and if we wanted to continue, next one would be fifty-five. It's five hundred, and so forth. So connect the dots. And we can see she can work more hours per week. So I'll extend this that way. 
So we can see that the function has two distinct sections. Here and here. Now, both of them are straight lines. Both of them are linear. She's earning a flat amount of money per hour. But it change, uh, the amount of money she makes changes abruptly. Now, this type of system might seem a little bit contrived, right? Uh, a little bit, oh, you just made it up for the problem. But this kind of thing happens all the time. Uh, in real life, like overtime is a real thing. This is exactly the kind of situation that happens in real life. But in, uh, but in like science in the natural world as well. Um, uh, Uh, kind of the classic example of a function that abruptly changes behavior is uh, something called a coefficient of friction, which is how much how much how much effort you have to push put into an object in order to push it. So when you push something, you can at fr it takes a lot of effort to get something moving, but once it starts moving, then the friction isn't as much of a problem. So that's an example where where something's behavior changes abruptly, depend at certain areas. You can also see this in ta when talking about uh, when talking about going passing through an interface, passing through some one region in the into another, like going from water to air on the surface of a pond. So again. A system where behavior changes abruptly. OK. So we've graphed this piecewise function that we described here. But we still haven't put it down as an equation. All right. Well, I'm trying to think of what the best way to describe this is. Well, we see here that we have two different regions, yeah? So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to write down the interval of these two regions. So this is going to go back to interval notation, which we learned a little while ago last week or different notations used for writing intervals. For piecewise functions, uh, we generally use, um, uh, oh, what was it? We generally use set builder notation, the one with all the greater, greater thans, less thans, and so forth. So for this function, we have two sections. We have the section that goes from 0 to 40. And then we have the section that is gr where, where, where our money is greater than 40. So, I'm, so I need a v variable here. Let's just call this variable x and this variable y. OK. So when our x, when 0 is less than or equal to x, and when x is less than or equal to 40, then we'll have one set of behavior. 
I'm going to shift this to the right just a smidgen so I get a little bit more room. OK. And let's figure out this equation. Well, this is a straight line, which means that it's going to be of the form y equals mx plus b. Now, its y-intercept is 0. That's where it's crossing the axis. And its slope is 8. So in this section here, our graph has this equation. But what about this section? Well, for this section, it has a slope of 12. But what about its y-intercept? I don't see a y-intercept here. Well, to find the y-intercept, we can extend it until we find where it would have had a y-intercept. And then we see where that y-intercept is. Make sense? Now, on this hand-drawn thing, especially because, especially in this hand-drawn thing, it's kind of hard to tell exactly where this y-intercept is. So we might have to do a little bit of math here. So so we know that this amount of money, at this amount of time, so far, she has earned $320, because at 40 hours, she's earned $320. And so I need to know how, f how far down this is going. And this is after 40 hours. So. If she, theoretically, if she had worked 40 hours at $12 an hour, she would have made $480. My little dotted line isn't quite straight. I'm going to make that a bit prettier. like that anyway eh, not perfect doesn't matter doesn't need to be perfect okay so we're trying to find that y-intercept so if she, in theory if she had spent this whole 40 hours working then she would have earned a total of 480 dollars so 320 minus 480 is 160. So we found this by So we figured out that this total distance here side to keep it from interfering with too much. We know that this total distance here is 480. And we know that this height here is 320. So this whole segment minus just this segment gives us 160. So we know that this y-intercept here is down at negative 160. So let me, negative 160, which means that for this section, we have, this, we have the equation 12x minus 160. So for this section, that's the section where x is greater than 40. 
Now note that this is specifically greater than 40, not greater than or equal to, because you earn that, you only earn overtime for hours you work above 40 hours, for hours you work greater than 40. And when talking about piecewise functions, we generally want to make it clear that it's all one big function. So we'll make a little bracket here. And then here, we'll give it the name. Let's say P of x. The pay you earn for x hours is equal to 8x. Will give us a value of 8 times the number amount number of hours we've worked for the first 40 hours and 12 times the number of hours worked minus 160 for every hour after 40. And there we go. We found an equation. And hey, now that we have this equation, Now that we have this equation, we can ask some more interesting questions. Or we can answer some questions that we maybe couldn't just from looking at the table of values. For example, How much money would she earn after working 37 hours? Now, 37 is on our table of values. But we can plug 37 into our function. Now, 37 is less than 40 and greater than 0. So it's going to fall in this section of the equation. So p of 37 is going to be 8 times 37. Which is? Two hundred and ninety six. So 37 hours of work will pay her $296. She needs a raise. Man, isn't that below, isn't that below Arizona's minimum wage? Hmm. Just because she's working part-time, they think that she can exploit her labor. Come on. OK, now that's for 37 hours. What about 43 hours. Well, 43 is in this section. 43 is a number greater than 40. So we can use this equation here. P of 43, or this set of rules here, rather. OK, so for hours at, she earns above 40, it's going to be 12 times the input, 43, minus 160. Using my calculator, uh, 12 times 43, that's 516, minus 160 is 356. Three hundred and fifty six dollar dues.
And just as a sanity check, coming over here, 43 hours gave us a number between, it should give us a number between 320 and 380, which we got. So it looks like our equation is valid. All right. So this is just one example of how a piecewise function works. A piecewise function has one set of behavior in one interval here, and a different set of behavior at a different interval. All right. So I'm going to go ahead, let's see, how much money would she earn after working 37 hours? Stuff. I'll leave this up here to make sure you get it copied down before we move on. Okay. So we'll look at another we'll look at another example. And then I'll we'll look at another example together and then I'll give you a piecewise function that I would like you to graph. So I'm gonna go ahead and move these aside. You can yell at me in the yell at me in the chat if you want me to put it back up on screen. Okay. So for this one, I'm going to have us instead of going through this entire system and looking at how it works, for this one, I'm just going to skip straight to the graph. Let's graph. F of x equals. Now, this one is going to have three different sections. Our first section is going to be 4x plus 11. Our next section is going to be x squared minus 1, and then x plus 1. So in this one, we'll be able to get some help using the transformation stuff that we learned about the other day. Now, what about our, the, dom the intervals of each section? Well, this first section is going to be from negative 10 
to negative 2. This next section will be from negative 2 to 2. And this last section will be from 2 to positive 10. Hmm. Actually, in the name of making sure that this actually fits on this graph, I'm going to make this go to like negative 5 instead. This is an example from the book, but as, but the book doesn't has a lot more space to work with in terms of up and down. So I'm going to make this a little bit better. OK. So how can I graph this? Well, this mx plus b is a straight line, which means that if I just draw two points and then extend the line through it, then I should be able to uh, draw it pretty effectively. This next section here, well, that's a parabola. We should be able to draw that using our transformations. And this next one is another straight line. So, well, let's see. If I plug negative 5 into this thing, f of negative 5, that's going to be 4 times negative 5 plus 11. That's 4 times negative 5. That's negative 20 plus 11. Uh, negative 9? So if we go left, by 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Then we'll be going down by 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There we go. Now, this is a straight line. So for every 1 we go over, we'll be going up by 4. Over 1, up 1, 2, 3, 4. And we'll keep on going into and we'll keep on going until negative two. So over one, up one, two, three, four here. Over one, up one, two, three, four here. Connect the dots, and there we go. Now for this next segment, which I'll go ahead and draw in blue. This is going to be a parabola. It's a regular parabola, but it's being shifted down by 1. So there we go. We'll go over left 1, up 1. Oh, did I mess up a little bit? Let's see, then when I go left two, I'm going to go up four. Oh, no, 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 I did mess up. Looks great. Okay, we can check this by plugging negative two into here. Negative two squared minus 1, that's 4 minus 1, which is 3. So left 2 up 3 to there. Mm -hmm. When I plug in 2, that's going to be, again, 2 squared minus 1 is 3. And now for this last section, it has a slope of 1 over 1, up 1, rise over run of 1. So if I plug 2 into this equation, I will get, oh, I'll do this in red, 2 plus 1. Two plus one is three, so when I go over two, I'll go up three. So there we go. And this has a slope of one. So over one, up one. Over one, up one. 
and so on. Not forever. This one does have a stopping point at 10. And there we go. So we graphed each of the sections, and together, this is our entire function. It behaves like this in this segment, this in this segment, and this in that segment. Fair enough? So that's what piecewise functions are all about. OK. So um, So we'll go ahead, let's see, I think we'll go, okay. So I'll go ahead and put input a piecewise, so next I'd like you to try doing it yourself. I'm gonna put a piecewise function up in front of the camera and I would like you to try graphing it. Now note that what I did to find our, that something that I did was I made sure I to find our endpoints, especially with these linear sections, because then it's really easy to draw it once you know the slope and all that. So I'm gonna put an equation here and I'm gonna ask you to draw a quick sketch. OK. So let's say that f of x, I'm just going to make this up off the top of my head. Let's say that f of x is equal to negative 2x in the interval from negative 3 to 1. And then it looks like x minus 3, where x is greater than 1. Go ahead and take a moment and try drawing a quick sketch of this. I'll give y'all about two minutes.
All right, so let's take a look. So in this segment, sometimes I sometimes you might find it helpful to sketch out which area on the x-axis we're working in. We're working from negative three to one. So we're starting at negative three and we're going up to one here. And for this section, it's everything greater than one. So okay. So we'll start just with this segment here. Well, this is a straight line with a slope of negative two and a y-intercept of zero. And zero is conveniently inside of this inside of this domain here. So we're definitely going to see that. Now, we have a slope of negative 2, so every 1 we go over will go down 2. But I shouldn't go any further than this in this direction, because it only has this behavior up to 1. But it does have this behavior to the left a little ways, so I'll sketch that out. There we go. Now in this segment, or everything to the right of one, it has a slope of one. And at this particular endpoint, that will have a value of one times one minus three equals negative two. Oh, how convenient. So I go over one down two. So they happen to be matching up. Now. I should mention that this is not necessarily guaranteed to happen. For all the piecewise functions we've looked at so far, each segment is neatly connected to each segment after that, or is each neatly connected to each other segment. But that isn't necessarily guaranteed to be true. Now, this one has a slope of 1. So I'll go over 1, up 1 for the next point, over 1, up 1 for the next point, and so on and so forth. And this one doesn't end. It just keeps on going. This segment, however, does end. This is a line segment rather than a ray. And there we go. All right. So now there is more that I'd like to say on the subject of uh, there is more that I'd like to say on the subject of piecewise functions, but we are going to go ahead and call it here. I will upload a small check for understanding, just like one, just like one question, one maybe two questions. Um, uh, so if you wait a little while, that'll be put that'll be put into uh, the learning modules. So today we learned what piecewise functions are. Piecewise functions are functions that have different behavior in different sections. You behave in one way in in one area in a different way in another area. We saw that how we can graph piecewise functions through making a table of values. We also saw how we can graph it when given the equation. So piecewise functions are something that is often thought of as, it's kind of easy to think that this doesn't really have an application in real life. But the reality is that there are lots and lots and lots of piecewise functions, not just in not just in science, but in everyday life. Uh, I can guarantee you that a lot of people in this call right now are going to have to think about how their overtime pay is going to work at some point. Um, uh, if you're being paid by the hour, this is something you'll, pro you'll have to think about at some point. Um, uh, other examples of piecewise function include how tax brackets work. Um, uh, you are taxed 
the first X dollars you make are taxed at one rate, and then each dollar after that is taxed at a different rate up until a certain amount of money, at which point it's taxed at a different rate, and so on. So um, uh, I think we can go ahead and call it there. Does anyone have any last minute questions they want to ask before I end the call? All right. So keep an eye. I haven't. It'll take me a few minutes to upload that check for understanding. So for right now, just so for for right now, we're pretty much done. Just give me a, a few minutes to get that up, and uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Now, like I said, tomorrow is a half day. Um. Uh, and we will be doing Khan Academy. How's that gonna work? Uh, How's it's that gonna work. That is a good question. Give me a moment to get the schedule. OK, so the schedule tomorrow, uh, each class is going to be 55 minutes long. So, oh, I don't need to record this section.